In this video I'm going to be covering all of the basic hammering techniques that a new smith needs to learn and master. In the last video I showed you how I shaped my hammers and in a video before that I discussed how I shaped my anvil face. In this video I'm going to be putting all that together and showing you how the hammer and the anvil work together to become a forging machine that will help you get through the work that you need to do. So here's where we all got started. I think this is day one for just about everybody. You take a bar, put a dead center in the anvil, and then take a hammer and start beating on it. It's the basic driving a nail home technique. It does have its uses, but unfortunately the processes that are going to give you the most trouble can't be approached in this way. So the first thing that you have to learn is that working in the center of the anvil with the flat face of the hammer is the most inefficient way of moving metal. So that technique is only used for processes where we either don't want to move any metal at all or we're making very, very slight changes to the shape of the piece. So for example, here I'm turning a square bar into a round bar. I'm not making the round bar any smaller, I'm just turning that square bar into a round bar. So all I need to do is to drive the corners of that square bar back onto itself and create a round bar. If, for example, I wanted to flatten this bar and turn it into a rectangular shape with rounded corners, the first thing you're going to notice is that you're going to have to really step up the amount of hammering that you're going to need to do to get this done. It's okay for short runs and for making slight changes like I have here, but you wouldn't use this technique to make any drastic change to this shape. The second technique that you need to learn is called drawing down, and that involves making drastic changes to the thickness of the bar, but not necessarily to the width of the bar. And for that technique, you need to move away from the flat face and tip your hammer over slightly until it starts forging with the rounded corners of the hammer face. If you're only forging a slight taper, you can stay in the center of the anvil and just use the corners of the hammers to start forging the bar out. The rounded corner of the hammer drives into the metal much easier than the flat face can, so it pushes the metal along the same way that a rolling pin does with a piece of clay. So you use this technique to do the rough shaping and then you go back to the center of the anvil and with the flat face start refining that surface to the finished dimensions that you need. If you need to make more of a drastic change to the shape you can use the same hammer technique but take the whole thing over to the edge of the anvil. Now the rounded corner of the anvil works with the rounded corner of the hammer and the metal is being pinched from both sides. So that has a very dramatic effect on the shape of the metal, especially as it gets thinner. This is a great technique for moving a lot of metal, but it's also a dangerous one. You get hooked on seeing that metal growing out of the bar. It's pretty easy to overshoot your target and to forge in a thin spot that you can't hammer out later. So as you can see, the basic technique that I use is to hammer a series of fullers along one edge of the bar and then I'll flip it 90 degrees and do the same thing to the other face of the bar. The metal here is going pretty much in one direction, so there really isn't any need to tumble the piece back and forth. Uh, I just find it easier to do a run of fullers on one side and then flip it, do a run of fullers on the other side. And again, the basic technique for all forging really is to do the rough work during the hottest part of the heat and then as the bar cools down, bring it back to the center of the anvil and use the flat face of the hammer to start refining that shape to see where you are and where the next heat has to go. The third technique that you need to master really isn't a technique in itself, but it's the ability to shift gears and to be able to go from heavy hammering and move into something that really requires very little effort. A lot of people have trouble putting a point on a bar, for example, and it's mainly because they really haven't been able to develop a sensitivity for how little pressure it really takes to move such a small piece of metal. The key to forging a point on a bar is to first establish the slopes on the four sides, and then to develop those slopes into a point. If you try to mash 
the two sides down to a point and then turn it over 90 degrees and mash those two sides back to a point. You're basically just going to start work hardening that piece and it will crack. Hammering a chisel point on the other hand is really just a matter of putting a slope on two faces of the bar and then turning the bar 90 degrees to control the width of that chisel point. The rounded corners of the anvil can also be used to hammer in what I call offsets. And offsets are basically just areas where a bar transitions from one dimension to another. The rounded corner of the anvil is a pretty convenient way of putting a nice smooth transition into a bar. Here I'm using the flat face of the hammer because I want to push the entire piece into the corner of the anvil. So what this transition allows me to do is to continue drawing down the end of the bar into a much smaller dimension. And when I'm done that offset will just turn into a smooth curve between the two sections. Anytime you're drawing down a long thin taper you always establish the point first and then you draw the taper down to that point. Now that the point is established, I can go back and establish the main dimensions of that section. Again, notice the rough forging and then finishing up with the flat of the hammer on the flat part of the anvil. Now we're shifting back into low gear again and we're turning a loop on the end of this bar. I start by wrapping the tip around one of the rounded corners of my anvil and then the rest of the process is really just tapping it into shape with very very light hammer blows. The key here is to have a very smooth taper without any irregularities so it just naturally wants to form into a curve when you tap it around. Here I'm setting up the next part of the process and you can see how that transition really simplifies this sharp bend. This sharp bend is going to turn into a larger loop on the end of this bar. I'm going to be able to start it the same way I did the smaller loop, but I won't be able to complete it there. I'm going to need to finish shaping this bend over the horn of an anvil. That can either be the horn of your main anvil or, as I have here, a small stake anvil. And the reason I have to do that with this one is because unlike the smaller loop where I started from the tip and started curling it towards the back, this one I'm starting at the back and working towards the tip so I don't really have any way of shaping that loop without hammering it around some kind of a form. So here's another angle of what I was doing. The tip isn't hot because I dipped it in water before coming over here. I need to hammer on that section so cooling it down will keep it from getting bent out of shape. So here's a technique for hammering a bar around a horn or a mandrel. To tighten the ring, hammer the unsupported end of the loop down off of the tip of the horn. To hammer the ring back open, you move the horn over to the unsupported side of the loop and then you hammer down on the section of the ring that is attached to the handle. So now that we've covered the three main techniques of forging metal along with a few related topics, we're ready to move on to the fourth technique, which involves using the opposite end of the hammer. The cross peen is the wide, narrow face of a forging hammer, and it sits 90 degrees to the handle. 
and its job is to move metal across the width of the bar. So it's basically doing the same job as drawing down, only instead of making the bar longer, cross peening makes the bar wider. The last technique that you need to learn about is called upsetting. When you're upsetting the bar, you're hammering the bar back onto itself to make it thicker. The simplest form of upsetting is when you just need a little bit of extra material at the end of the bar. So for that application, all you need to do is to take a short heat off the end of the bar and then take a very light hammer and drive the end of the bar back onto itself. I always use a light hammer when I'm upsetting. The lighter hammer seems to deliver more of a sharp impact, which seems to be beneficial for this process. I also rotate the bar as I'm hammering, so that tends to correct any tendency for the bar to veer off in one direction or another. Now it may not look like I did a whole lot, but when I push the metal all over to one side, you can see that I've actually gained a fair amount. The other application for upsetting is to provide some extra material somewhere along the length of the bar. Here I'm setting up to demonstrate what's normally referred to as a square corner. When you bend a bar without modifying the shape in any way, the inside and the outside of that bend are curved. When you're forging a square corner, you're actually tightening up that curve to such a point where you're able to hammer the ends of each bar that's going into that corner. And once you do that, you can start upsetting those two bars to get the extra bit of material that you need to fill in that radius and provide that nice outside square corner. So that's the whole story. In terms of forging metal, there hasn't been anything made in the last 3,000 years that has used anything but the techniques that I've shown you in this video. There are a lot of variations and there are countless numbers of combinations of techniques that you can use to build something, but it still all boils down to a series of sequences that involve these basic techniques. Hi, I'm Dennis and thanks for watching. As most of you know, for the past few years I've been producing YouTube videos on a part-time basis. I am now looking to turn that hobby into a full-time job and for that I really need your help. A small monthly contribution from a really small number of viewers will generate the income that I need to achieve that goal. So if you're interested in the work that I'm doing and you want to lend your support, please click on the Patreon icon at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. We'll see you next time.